Good afternoon, and welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Rachel Kinderdine, Community Manager, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, The Political Thought of Xi Jinping. We are joined by Steve Tsang, Director of the China Institute at the SOAS University of London and co-author of the book that is the subject of today's event, The Political Thought of Xi Jinping. Our moderator is Alex Wong, Professor of Law at the UCLA School of Law. For those of you who would like to submit questions for our speakers, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can type in your questions. I'll be managing those questions during the Q&A segment, which should start in about 35 minutes. So I want to thank you both again, Steve and Alex, for being here. And Alex, I'll turn the conversation over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, so welcome. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Steve Sang talking about his new book. First of all, congratulations, Steve, for uh, finishing this book and getting it out into the world. It's always a big moment and a, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, book and looking forward to talking uh, with you about uh, about the content of it. So, well, thank you very much, Alex and Rachel as well. Delighted to be here. Wonderful. So why don't we just dive right in? Um, your book is about the political thought of Xi Jinping. And I wanted to ask you to kind of set the stage for us before we get into the substance of what that political thought um, is exactly. And you you lead off the book by talking about why ideology or understanding Xi's ideology is important these days. And you draw a contrast with the pragmatism of, of Deng Xiaoping. And so Tell us a little bit about how you're conceptualizing this. How you're thinking about ideology? Why is it more important than it was before? And how is it different than Deng's pragmatism? And that'll lead us oh. into what that that ideology actually is. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. That's a really good question to kick off. China since 1949 has three leaders, three really notable leaders. There are two others. But you have, of course, Mao Zedong, who very much had his thought being added to Maxim Leninism. So China under Mao did have an ideology, which essentially was Maxim Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. Now, when Deng Xiaoping took over as supreme leader in December 1978, he effectively tried to put the ideology on the back burner. And that's, I think, what you meant by his uh, pragmatism essentially prevailed. And the Deng East era essentially continued with Zhang Jimin and Hu Jintao. After Xi Jinping became leader, he spent nearly five years to work to reviving the importance of ideology as the guiding force for at first guiding the government and the party, and eventually guiding everybody and everything in China. He's clearly intending that ideology should make a comeback. And he has also, now with the benefit of hindsight, made it quite clear that he is a transformational leader, not a managerial leader like Hu Jintao or Zhang Jimin. And mm -hmm. for him, the ideology matters. Therefore, we need to understand what he intends his thought to, to be like and how it will function in guiding China until he is no longer himself guiding China. Mm -hmm. And that's the direction we're going. Mm -hmm. Now, just to ask a follow-up to that before we get into the, the content of the ideology, uh, are you then drawing a connection between Xi and, and Mao in that sense? And then a related question is, uh, because they're both ideologically driven in, in your view, and then uh, Deng's pragmatism was also driven by certain values, presumably, right? And and so just a follow up on that question to how distinct is the Xi ideological approach from the, uh, the Deng pragmatism? Well, I think very good follow-up question, because if we try to understand China's ideology from since Mao, then we will be addressing the question of the signification of Marxism-Leninism. 
And for Mao, the signification of Marxism-Leninism means trying to adapt Marxism-Leninism to the agrarian context of China and how the communist revolution would not be a proletariat revolution, but an agrarian one. Deng Xiaoping, in a sense, fundamentally changed the Mao Maoist approach. And instead of looking at all that, and he's not abandoning communism in any serious sense, but he was basically saying that, let's put that aside. Let's build up capacity. Let's build up the economy. It's only when we are rich and powerful before we can talk about all those. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was never fully achieved in his time. Mm -hmm. For Xi Jinping, when he now come and say he's, he is really pushing forward, pushing forth the signification of Marxism-Leninism, he's not doing what Mao did. He's doing something very, very different. He is making Marxism-Leninism Sino-centric. He is use, reviving Chinese past, Chinese tradition, and his views of how China should be uh, treated in the rest of the world. Hmm. And add to that and say that Marxism really is natural to China, rather than saying that Marxism is something very foreign, very different, it has to be adapted to fit into the Chinese context, otherwise it won't work. Now it is meant to be seamless dovetailing of each other. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a different approach. Mm -hmm. He is not mm -hmm. just imitating Mao. Yeah. He intends to go beyond. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so so you've you've laid out a couple of very intriguing ideas. So I want to dive into the, the substance of the book. And you talk about both domestic and global aspects of the ideology. So let's unpack that a little bit and talk about each. Maybe let's start with the domestic side of things first and uh, talk about uh, what you see as the content of the ideology. And then importantly, we're going to talk about implications. You know, how how well is this ideology, you know, how is this impacting things actually in the real world? Well, if one has to summarize what Xi Jinping thought is all about for China, what Xi Jinping is trying to, to, to build in China is one country, one people, one ideology, one party, one leader. Now, this is something which is really quite uh, ambitious to do. And let me underline that what I'm now saying is really just about what Xi Jinping would like to do. I am not saying that what he likes to do will be done, will be achieved and accomplished. Mm -hmm. But to do so, it means that he wants to completely reinvigorate the Communist Party as an, as a Leninist instrument as the instrument for the core leader of the Communist Party, which I would say in plain English, as the supreme leader, mm -hmm. who will use the Communist Party to govern and lead and direct the whole country with an ideology which will be used to shape people's thinking so that everybody will think about China and its mission, the China dream, if you like, the China dream of national rejuvenation is what Xi Jinping officially calls it. And works together under that solid leadership to deliver that grand China dream by at the latest, the end of 2049, the centenary year for the founding of the People's Republic. So sometimes if you if you read his statements, he will refer to 2049 as the year, and sometimes he said 2050. But what he really meant is the end of 2049. Right. And so then what are you know you you break uh in your chapters, you break this down into a few different areas. And I would love to see 
which of the areas you think are the most important for the audience to understand? I mean, you you have a couple of things, you know, just to look at your chapter titles, you 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 talk about reinvigorating the party, uh, the party leading everything. Intriguingly, you talk about a new de facto social contract. Uh, you talk about three new economic goals. You talk about a party-centric focus on nationalism. Which of those are the most important in your view? And can you give us some specific examples of how, right? Because some some of the, you you also point out that some of some people view this as you know it's just kind of propaganda. It's the things that people say, and then they're they're doing, you know, under one view they just kind of go about their business apart from this language. But you you are making the point that the ideology matters. So how, how is it driving um, specific actions and policies? Well, it is trying to make every put them all together and tries to make everything all, all fit into a kind of one nest, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there is only one dimension of it which stands out as particularly important or the most important. Yeah. They are in some ways almost equally important because they reinforce one and other. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the party invigoration, um, Xi Jinping started off as leader by launching what at the time was widely seen as a anti as an anti-corruption campaign, except that they were all wrong. It was never meant to be an anti-corruption campaign. A campaign is something that has a starting point and an ending point. Hmm. What Xi Jinping has always intended it to be was an anti-corruption drive which could be used to take out anybody within the party leadership who is not loyal to him mm -hmm. or who is not sufficiently committed to the cause that he has defined for China. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of in party talk, a party ratification campaign in substance and anti-corruption operations in name. Mm -hmm. And it's only by doing so can he enable the parties to do what he declared as a mission of the party in the 19th Party Congress in 2017, which was that it matters not whether it is east, west, south, north, or in the middle, matters not whether you're talking about party, state, military, civilian or educational spheres, the party leads everything. But how do you then change uh, change people to do that? You have to get people to learn about it. And that is where the ideology comes into the, in, into the picture and becomes so important. He's doing it by, first of all, requiring everybody, to, everybody in the party to use an app, Xie Xi Changguo. And through that app, then they are required to daily learn about Xi Jinping thought. It is a kind of 21st digital version of Mao's little red book mm. of the Cultural Revolution. You also then have the social contract. The social contract is important because the social contract, the de facto social contract, effectively, effectively came into existence after the Beijing Mexico of 1989. It was basically a very good system of everybody in China accepting the monopoly of power by the Communist Party in return for the party delivering rapid economic growth and therefore improvements in living standards. Mm. Xi Jinping's new social contract is that he is going to make people proud of China, mm -hmm. not just um, getting a bit of a better life. Mm. And to make everybody in China proud of China, it means that if you were not sufficiently Chinese, and what does Chinese mean? Chinese means, first of all, adhering to the traditional Chinese values and civilization which effectively means Han civilization. It also means that you have to be loyal to the party and the supreme leader. 
You take all three boxes, you're a patriotic Chinese citizen, and you should be very proud. And the party will make you have reasons to be proud because China will be standing tall in the world. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means your pro-democracy people in Hong Kong have to be re-educated to become patriotic Chinese. It means your Uyghurs and Tibetans and other minorities have to be leveled up to behave more like proper Han Chinese who loves the party and the leader. Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of those changes are being brought about. And the if effect will be eventually everybody will come and support that uh, mission he has defined and led by the party and make China great again. Great in the sense of how Xi Jinping conceives it, not in terms of how the rest of the world sees it. Yeah. So I want to follow up with that to ask you how the audience should interpret what you've just said. You know, it all sounds a bit ominous. And for those who are worried about China's rise, this feels worrying. Uh, it feels a little bit, you know, for those uh, scholars who characterize the current situation as approaching like a totalitarian situation, you know, it seems like your description is leaning in that direction. Is this something that uh, is is something uh, that people should be worried about, and to uh, you know, if you were spo speaking to a supporter of the model, I think someone might say, "Well, you know, this is in the service of these economic or stability goals, and this is the apparatus necessary to achieve those things." Right? They they might present it as uh, as the the necessary means to achieve desirable. Ends. I'm, I'm curious as to how, you, sort of, how you take the uh, this after seeing this full picture of what is being proposed. How do you, how how should we understand that? Now, I think you're completely right, Alex, in saying that from certain people's perspective, from Xi's perspective, from the party's uh, perspective, and his supporters' perspective, this is all fantastic mm -hmm. because it means that all the national strength can be concentrated and galvanized and collectively they can achieve the unthinkable, the impossible. Now, that all sounds very well in theory, but in practice, we, uh -huh. are, we are already seeing changes that happened which are quite problematic. Now, whatever you think about the Communist Party of China, I think we have to deal with historical events in a dispassionate way. And one of the things that we can see is that after the Beijing Mexico of 1989, for at least a quarter of a century, the Communist Party of China did not make one single major policy mistake that could potentially destabilize the system. Not one for a quarter of a century. This is quite an amazing achievement. They did that by strengthening collective leadership in the party in the Deng East, extended Deng, Deng Xiaoping era through Zhang Jimin and Hu Jintao. They increasingly enlarged the scope for debate at the top echelon of policy making in China in that period. And that closed door, top secret, vigorous debates, and able the party to avoid making one big policy mistake. Since Xi Jinping consolidated his power and effectively replaced the collective leadership by an echo chamber, mm. and that happened in 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. we have seen mistake after mistakes mm. being made. We and have seen thinking of specifically, are you thinking of COVID response or, or other things? I think that there's a long list of policy mistakes one can one one can recite. But the most glaring mistake was of course the enforcement of the zero COVID policy mm -hmm. and above all the sudden reversal of the zero COVID policy a few weeks after the 20th Party Congress 
during which Xi Jinping openly and publicly and courageously reaffirmed that the zero COVID policy was the right policy for China and it was not going to be changed in the foreseeable future. Mm. And that was because suddenly um, at the end of November 2022, when the, after the, the anti-zero COVID policy uh, protests started, mm. there were some people showing blank papers in the protests. Yeah. And Xi Jinping suddenly saw that as a challenge to the authority of the Communist Party and of himself. And therefore, without consultation, without preparation, without planning, he reversed zero COVID policy. And hundreds of thousands of people died as a result, maybe up to a million or more. Mm. That is not what the Communist mm. Party normally does. The mm. Communist Party normally prepares and plans. Mm -hmm. And this is a clear illustration of how that focus on of oneness in reality is doing a lot of damage mm. to China. Very interesting. Any, anything else you want to mention now that uh, things, you know, th th that being a very big one, but are other other policy decisions that you think are vulnerable to this echo chamber effect right now well, in modern day China? We, we, yeah, if you want, you can, you can have the Hong Kong policy. Mm -hmm. When China introduced the national security law for Hong Kong in 2020, the 2019 protests had already ended. Mm -hmm. It was not necessary. If China had to have um, some security policy in place in Hong Kong, they could have required Hong Kong to en enact a legislation under the Article 23 of the Hong Kong Basic Law, which would not then have led to the rest of the world seeing the so-called one country, two system model in Hong Kong being completely abandoned and putting Hong Kong on a completely different trajectory from where it was before. So that was completely avoidable. It was unnecessary. You can have policy in terms of the trade war with the United States, whether it was the Trump era or the Biden administration. Um, you have the Chinese policy towards uh, Europe, the European Union, um, a part of the world that was incredibly relaxed in engaging with China and helping China to develop, modernize, and grow, which become terrified of what China may or may not be doing. Mm -hmm. You have the policy in Xinjiang, which delivers the counter productive results to China in terms of not only not uh, leveling up the, 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 the place and its people, is creating so much tension that some people outside of China use words that the Chinese government found totally objectionable, but hugely damaging to China's international image. Mm. By a government that is more committed to building up soft power than any that we have ever seen in China. It's hard so to build soft power when you're being accused of genocide, right? Is that what you mean? Well, I'm glad you 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 mentioned it. I would prefer to try to not use emotive words like that. Yeah, yeah. But that is exactly what is happening. Um, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to shift gears. I think a very uh, interesting discussion about the domestic uh, context. Uh, you also talked about the global context. What what are the what's the content of the ideology for um, the international context and and global receptions of um, of uh, China's rise? Now that really is pushing the China dream of national juvenile, national rejuvenation to its ultimate goal, because the. Uh, forging of one country, one people, one ideology, one party, one leader is not quite the end itself. The objective is to make China great again, 
Now, what does that actually mean? What it means is not for China to outcompete the United States in the existing liberal international order dominated by the US and the, in quotation marks, the West. And that's why Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership have been openly saying that they don't want Cold War 2.0. Now, what they are trying to do is to change the game. What Xi Jinping wants is return China to what he believes was China's rightful place in history and in his conception of history. And here we have to bear in mind that Xi Jinping's conception of history may not bear much resemblance to the actual historical uh, events. Uh, because since uh, 2013, with, art, with document number nine, he has effectively banned any version of history that does not correspond to his version of history. Um, if you do that, you are committing the heinous crimes of historical nihilism. So he has a monopoly of that history. And in this reconstruction of history, the world were at its best of times when China was the strongest, richest, most powerful, most advanced, most civilized, and most benevolent state in the world. So much so that when China was at its zenith, countries outside of China look up to China, admires China, wants to learn from China or imitate Ch from China and follow the leadership of China. And therefore, the world enjoyed, or the civilized world anyway, enjoys Pax Sinica, Chinese peace. And hence, Xi Jinping would claim that China and the Chinese people do not have any imperialist gene in their gene pool. That China has never been an imperialist empire in any way ever. So what Xi Jinping would like is to transform the world order from the Americans dominated Western hegemony based liberal international order into a Sinocentric order that's resembling the old Chinese concept called the Ten Sha, all under heaven. And how he would like to do that is that he would democratize the international order by winning support from the global south, which are more numerous both in terms of population and in terms of countries. And if they all support China and transform the UN and the international organizations from the Western dominated liberal international order into the Chinese leading Tianxia order, the world will be a better place. And the world will always be a better place because Xi Jinping in his own view sees himself and the Communist Party of China as the greatest force for good. So if they are in charge, it is for the better. It can't be otherwise. Very interesting. So uh, to follow up on that, then what are the implications for, say, US policy or European policy or you know, other countries' engagement with China? Right, As we know, here in the United States, the uh, active policy of the Trump administration and the Biden administration uh, in some ways, have not been uh, that different, right? The, the current Chinese strategy treats China as a competitor, uh, and uh, the U.S. is trying to outcompete China to build alliances uh, uh, against a perceived uh, China uh, threat. So, does your account suggest that uh, that's a case of over securitization, or is the response? Uh, in uh, Europe, in the United States, is that warranted? Because the one view of what you've just said is also that it feels 
uh, ominous to the current uh, the current uh, leaders of the world, uh, or or should they take it uh, more at face face value, right? And in the area I work in most in climate change, China is making that argument that their leadership on wind and solar and batteries, you know, as China builds its strength in those areas, it's also good for the rest of the world, right? So that's a very concrete manifestation of what you've just described in uh, principle. And there are hundreds of other examples uh, of that as well. So, you know, how how should those of us here in the United States uh, understand, again, that, that, uh, that ideology as you've described it? Well, excellent question again. I think we need to think about two things. One is that we must do everything we can to avoid getting into a situation of ending up in a war with China. I think if we end up in that situation, we are putting ourselves in a situation where there can be no serious real winners. Um, the fact that Xi Jinping doesn't think that and he's pushing doesn't mean that we, we behave the way he does, because if we did, then we are talking about train crash that is going to happen with horrendous consequences for everybody. And the second thing is that we have to really understand what Xi Jinping tries to do and how he is going to do, do this and come up with effective ways to counter them without triggering that confrontation which we should need to avoid. So complete decoupling is not necessarily the solution because the complete decoupling means that there is less reason for people not to uh, avoid a war. Uh, with the le level and, the, and complexity of economic integration between China and the rest of the world at the moment. Um, even Xi Jinping, who is not known for his knowledge of economics, will know that he can't actually go to war with us without destroying the Chinese economy. So there is a significant constraint there. Mm -hmm. But the drive behind that uh, ambition to change the international order is through the global south. Mm. And that is where we, we need to focus on contesting. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't do other things to uh, have the capacities to prepare for a contingency uh, should that ever materialize. But the real focus is that we need to focus, we need to be able to win over support from the global south so that China cannot simply change the way how the international order uh, operates by claiming enough support from the much more numerous, poorer, and by and large, less democratic countries in the world. We will also have to bear in mind that domestically in China, that is beyond our reach. Mm -hmm. We cannot change how things go in China. That is for people in China to do that. But if we hold our line, we should be able to give Xi Jinping just enough scope to make the kind of mistakes he's already making, but in much bigger scale, which would then unleash forces domestically that push for changes. Hmm. I think it is uh, not accurate to say that Xi Jinping is already achieving all his uh, ambitions of taking China into a more than digital totalitarian system, hmm. because we know there are plenty of people in China, and indeed in the Communist Party, who are not happy with the direction of travel. Mm. But with the degree and effectiveness of digital technology-backed repression and control, it is at the moment not realistic or possible for people to organize themselves into opposition in China 
or within the Communist Party. But that is not the direction of travel the people in China particularly wanted. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people there who were much more comfortable with the direction of travel that China was previously on from the Deng Xiaoping through the Jiang Zemin to the Hu Jintao era. They were unhappy about things like the scale of corruption that was prevailing in the Hu Jintao era. But they were much more relaxed, much more comfortable with the more relaxed atmosphere in the Jiang Zemin Hu Jintao era. They were much more happy with the greater scope for personal freedom in that earlier era. So mm -hmm. things can still change. Mm. So I want to ask one last question, and then uh, we have a number of uh, Q&A questions, and so I'll invite Rachel to come back to ask those questions. Um, based on what you understand about the ideology, the global ideology, to what extent could you imagine a world where the current world order coexists with what you've described as the Chinese intention? You know, one part of the rhetoric, the Chinese rhetoric is to encourage the appreciation of a diversity of ways of running things to sort of create some space, I think, uh, for the Chinese uh, approach. So do you think coexistence is a possibility or do you think it's a, more of a, a dynamic of managing sort of uh, conflicting or, or different models with some tension in, uh, between them? I believe that competition actually make us improve and get better. Mm -hmm. So competition from China against the liberal international order is not necessarily inherently a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The liberal international order has its strength, but it, it also has its uh, uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Not all Chinese criticisms are totally wrong and unjustified mm -hmm. because for all the goodness that the liberal international order has delivered, it does prioritize the developed world, the liberal democracies that also happens to be the rich countries in the world. We do need to pay a lot more attention to the poorer, less developed parts of the world. Hmm. We do need to engage with them in ways that uh, take into account much more of their sensitivities and their potential. So if we are going to um, come out well in this competition, and the competition is a reality, it's already happening. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not something that we can say, we don't want it and therefore it will go away. Um, the Chinese will be pushing it, so it is already there. Mm. But to come out better, and if we then win, what I would describe as a beauty contest, mm. the world will end up being a better place. And all we need to do is really to hold off to make sure that Xi Jinping does not achieve his ambition. And it is not about China or Chinese people because we do have to make a distinction. Xi Jinping may not make a distinction. For him, he is the Communist Party. He represents China. But to us, they are separate things. We want China, we want Chinese people to be part of that global community. What we valued in terms of our rights, our liberty, our dignity, are things that we would also like people in China to be able to enjoy. But only they can assert that in their own country. It's not for us to impose it on them. Mm -hmm. Well, Steve, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, uh, and I know there are a lot of uh, questions already coming up in the Q&A, so I want to provide enough time for that and invite uh, Rachel to come back and uh, ask those questions. So I'll hand it off to, to Rachel now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to just thank you both again for, for being here um, and Steve for such incredible insights during this conversation. We really appreciate your, your knowledge. Um, so I want to start with this question from an audience member who asked, She's watchword during his campaign to rein in large corporations in China and make them serve the goals of the CCP first has been common prosperity. What is your understanding of what she means by common prosperity? 
Thank you, Rachel. And it's a very, very good question. Before I address the specifics of the Common Prosperity Program, uh, let me uh, underline that Xi Jinping time and again uh, declare that he is a Marxist. Uh, he doesn't describe himself as a Leninist, but he describes himself as a Marxist. Now, a Marxist or Marxism is really about social justice. It is also something that is, when achieved, ultimately will deliver the communist utopia, where the state will wither us away, where people will live in a, in a world from which, from home according to one's ability and to home according to one's needs. That's what Marxism ultimately will deliver. Marxism does not deliver common prosperity. Xi Jinping does not ask for that social justice. Xi Jinping is the leader of a party that leads everything, everywhere in China. If there's any government in the world that can deliver social justice, by administrative fiat or by legislation, it is China. He's not going there. Instead, he's talking about common prosperity, both of the mind and of your material life. And the common prosperity of the mind basically means you learn about the good things and you will all be able to share it. And that good thing is, of course, Xi Jinping thought. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, you can all learn it. The party gives it to you for free. Xi Jinping shares it with you. The material one, ah, it means asking for the rich individuals or corporates to contribute to philanthropy for courses selected by the party so that they will not get excessively rich and the poor will get some benefits out of it. That's not a very socialist Marxist way of doing things, but that is the Xi Jinping way. And Xi Jinping is totally against what he called welfareism. There you go, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Our next question is uh, focused more on the geopolitical side of things, but this audience member asked, does Xi's view of China's future include the return to its Sinocentric influence over the rest of Asia Pacific as tributary states, i.e. both Koreas, Vietnam, etc.? Well, the one thing we have to bear in mind is that even in the authentic uh, traditional Chinese worldview, beyond Xi Jinping, that worldview was never regional. In the heydays of the Chinese empire, it was never just about regional hegemony. It was about the whole world. The views of the old imperial Chinese dynasties were remarkably similar to the views of imperial Rome at the heydays of the Roman empire. The Roman Empire or the Chinese Empire, under whatever Greek dynasty was, was the civilized world. Beyond that, you have other states which are closer to the civilized world and they are being more civilized and they are being uh, slowly absorbed into the civilized part of the world. Ultimately, you go beyond that and you have the lands of the barbarians. But that is the areas beyond the reach of Chinese civilization or Roman civilization. That's how they actually saw it. Because we didn't have globalization in the ancient world. So going back into the Xi Jinping type of thing, uh, idea of thinking, it is still universal, it's still global, it's not regional. China's 
dominance is not meant to be purely regional. Regional, even though the vicinity of China is, if you like, the the front yards and the back yards of China, so they needs to be kept tighter under Chinese influence or control. But that is something which is meant to be extended to the rest of the world, where I think there is a difference between the way how, um, if you like, Western hegemons and Chinese hegemons behave is that China, Western hegemony largely is about formal control. The Chinese one is mostly about informal control. If you acknowledge my paramountcy, that's good enough. I don't necessarily have to be sending a proconsul to you to, to run your place. So you, you, we don't necessarily need to have you formally accepted as a vassal state. In the same vein, this audience member asked, what role does Russia play in Xi's strategy? Russia is a all-weather strategic partner of China, as they would call it, and they actually manage it in a significant way. Russia under Putin has done a lot to disrupt the liberal international order and to show up the problems of the US dominated world order. And therefore, Russia is a very useful partner to China. And Putin himself is a leader whom Xi Jinping has respect because Putin is able to deliver so much. Uh, we are talking about, in Chinese terms, the size of the Russian economy being comparable to the size of the economy of the Guangdong province of China. And imagine, for a country like China that talks about comprehensive national power, that a Guangdong province equivalent in Russia being able to fold that kind of weight in world affairs. And largely in line with what the Chinese would like to be done, that's got to be a pretty good partner. So that strategic partnership is for real. Shifting gears a bit to possible internal challenges that she might face. Uh, this audience member asked, how does she intend to deal with China's aging and declining population, skewed sex ratio, deflation, and massive property debt? That's a very good question. One that I don't think Xi Jinping has very clear answer. Um, he does not actually see the demographic change as as much of a challenge and a problem as many of us uh, observing China, outside of China, see, or some uh, demographers in China itself uh, can see. Demographic change is a slow burner. It's something that happens at a relatively slow pace, particularly at the beginning, until it then suddenly gets a pace um, in a much more exponential way. So we are only seeing the beginning of that demographic shift. And Xi Jinping is focused very much on increasing China's economic power, which to him means innovative power, which would then also be easily uh, mistaken as strengthening economic uh, productivity. And if you can increase your economic productivity, then your demographic changes and the effect of economic slowdown as a result of demographic shrinkage can be compensated by replacing a population-based economy to a technology-driven and technology uh, high productivity-based economy. So he, at the moment, seems to think that China is able to deal with them uh, very well, 
but the reality is much, much more different. Um, he is aware that the debt problem is serious, but he's not coming up with very serious way of dealing with it. He's aware that the economy is slowing and is problematic, and things need to be done, but he is not willing to put money into the hands of your average Chinese citizens in order to increase general consumption and use that general consumption as the ways to pull the economy up. Here, he behaves more like communist leaders have done since the Soviet Union was created, which is that economic um, product of um, economic uh, resources needs to be invested and guided by the party, and therefore they're being invested more in infrastructure, which are not producing the level of return in stimulating the economy as a cons consumption-driven model would deliver. So no, in terms of the econ economy, he is not so far delivering very good ways of dealing with the challenges China faces. So we've had a couple of audience members ask this question, but you mentioned not everyone in the Communist Party is necessarily on board with Xi's vision, um, but that he has goals extending through 2049. So is there any kind of sense of who might be a likely candidate for a successor to Xi? Um, is that a conversation that's being had? There is a, it's a very simple, short answer to that one. No. There is no succession, succession arrangement. There is no successor being named. And unless Xi Jinping starts to change the way how he thinks about it, there may not be one being named at all. Um, that's why in that formulation I recited earlier on, it ends with one leader. It does not so far have any indication of any succession arrangement. So you you mentioned earlier quite a bit um, of potential ways that China could, um, that we would hopefully in, in avoid a military conflict with China. But I wanted to ask this audience member's question, who first of all, thank you for your unique insight. Um, they said, do you believe that China's boring state's history foretells China's military strategy going forward? Have we reached the point where China feels confident to ask how heavy is the emperor's cauldron? And if so, do you think that there's a path to avoid military conflict? I think there must be a way to avoid military conflict with China. I think it is absolutely critical that we try to do that. Um, before I come back to this point, I think what I want to say is that the most likely trigger for a military confrontation with China is Taiwan. Um, China taking Taiwan is part of Xi Jinping's China dream of national rejuvenation. The dream cannot be deemed to have been fulfilled until China, until China has taken Taiwan or taken back Taiwan, depending on your perspective. And that means it has to happen by the end of 2049, 25 years from now. Now, if we have a very clear, as now we do, uh, potential flashpoint, then it's a question of what do we do to make sure this does not come to pass. Many in the US have talked about deterrence, and that deterrence is essentially based on military deterrence. Uh, what I would put to you is that Military deterrence on its own cannot do the job. Uh, and this is not to say that um, US should not increase its military preparedness and therefore capacities to deal with a real contingency if it should come to pass. All I'm saying is that military deterrence cannot work. And it is not because the United States cannot build up a military big enough, strong enough, to defeat China, it is because deterrence only work 
when the ones to be deterred can see it, understands it, and is willing to act on it. If the one to be deterred either can't see it, won't see it, or having seen it, won't react, respond to it, then your deterrence still doesn't work. Uh, world history is full of examples of leaders starting wars that they could not possibly win and almost certainly would lose and then lose. So, the, and the reason why it cannot work in China is because the policy making process has been changed so much in China that no general or admiral in China can tell Xi Jinping that we must, we need to act on the deterrence because the general who say so will be cashiered right away. Whereas if he goes to war, he may not, China may not lose, B, or if China should lose, he could put, potentially blame somebody else. He himself may not be in trouble and all, all of that. So the only way to deter is economic deterrence because Xi Jinping understands perfectly well that if the Chinese economy is completely destroyed, his leadership of the Communist Party itself could be challenged. And this is the very last thing Xi Jinping would want to see. And he doesn't need any advisor to tell him that. And so if we can deliver that, then we can have that deterrence. And with that deterrence, we can engage and find a way out without necessarily ending up in that point that we don't really want to be in. So I want to finish out with this question. Um, you mentioned that it's up to the people in China to really change the situation there, but that it's very difficult to organize right now. So under a leader like Xi Jinping, would that kind of organization ever be possible or will it take some kind of change um, to open, open the door to potential different ways of ruling? Well, in the short term, probably no. Um, because Xi Jinping is so determined to uh, sniff out any sign of challenge to him. And that's effectively the first thing he said when he became leader of China back in 2012. And he said the problem with the collapse of the Soviet Union was that when within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, a traitor like Gorbachev emerged, comrades were not men enough to stand up against him and stop him. This won't happen in his, in his watch. So he is determined to do that. And unless something substantial happens in China, this is likely to continue. But we're talking about somebody who is 70 years old or 70 years young, and he is not gonna get any younger. And that aging effect will applies to all of us. So things which can change moving forward, just not yet. Well, thank you so much again, Steve. I know our audience really appreciates you answering their questions. And thank you to the audience as well for such wonderful questions. Um, I want to turn it back over to you and Alex, if you have any closing remarks for the program. Wonderful. I just wanted to thank Steve for uh, taking the time to tell us about the uh, book. We had a, a very sizable uh, audience here, and thank you for uh, taking the time. And all I would like to say is to thank you very much indeed for having me. And as to Xi Jinping, we need to understand him for what he is, not to under underestimate him, but also not to overestimate him. We need to know exactly what he is, what his thought is about, what he aims to do, where his strengths are, and where his weaknesses are. Then we can de devise sensible ways to engage him and the country he needs in a constructive way. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Steve. I think that's a, a great way for us to close out the program and for all of us to, to think about moving forward.
I also want to uh, let everyone know we've put a link to the book, The Political Thought of Xi Jinping, in the chat and a discount code as well to get 30% off the book if you purchase it directly from the publisher. Uh, the discount code is ASFLYQ6, so you'll get 30% off. Um, that's in the chat if you'd like it. But I want to thank our members and audience again. We hope to see you at one of our upcoming programs. Next Thursday, February 1st, we'll have the February edition of the Dan Schnur Political Report. Dan's going to be covering Biden, Trump, or dot, 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 a case for a fourth political party. And then on February 13th, we hope you'll join us for a conversation with Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, who also serves as the chair of the Democratic Association of Secretaries of State. She'll be talking about the 2024 elections ahead of Super Tuesday. So we hope to see you at one of the, the upcoming programs. And thank you again to Steve, Alex, and the audience for joining us today. Mm -hmm.